Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to our program, Light from Above. Glad you could be with us today. We're studying some lessons about the New Testament church, and we've been looking at some portraits or some pictures of the New Testament church, some things that we can learn from that. And our term today is the term nuphe, the Greek term nuphe. And you might think, well, what does that word mean? Well, we'll show you the preview of our lesson, and it won't take you very long to figure out what we're talking about. We're talking about the picture, a portrait of a bride. The New Testament church is portrayed as a bride. So we'll look at the definition a little bit here, then we'll talk about the idea of preparation, purity, and provisions. Now here is a Greek lexicon showing the term nuphe, and if you look and you take a look, you'll notice that it shows up in seven verses. The word appears eight times in the Greek New Testament, and is translated as a bride, sometimes as a daughter-in-law. But we have the idea here of a bride. The idea of husband, a wife, a groom, or a bride, or marriage, these are all used in the New Testament to refer to the New Testament church. It's, some, it's something the Apostle Paul uses, as we'll see in a minute. But, you know, I want to talk about the idea of a provision, a dowry payment. You know, that's something that's sort of gone by the wayside, at least in our country. Don't hear much about that, at least you don't hear much about it. It's probably still done. And I was looking at dictionary.com, and it had these things to say about it. A dowry is a payment made upon the creation of the marriage. Sometimes the prospective husband pays the father of the bride. Sometimes the family of the husband pays the family of the bride. And sometimes the woman brings property or money to the marriage for her husband. Now, if you look in the Old Testament or look in the Bible, you'll find instances of dowries. Uh, for example, in Genesis chapter 34, Shechem wanted to pay a dowry to Jacob so that he could marry Dinah. Now, he defiled her. And he was trying to make things right, and it was a very ugly situation. And he offered to pay money, or property, or whatever, as a form of payment. That was referred to as a dowry. Also, another one, rather gruesome one, is in 1 Samuel 18.24, the discussion between Samuel, excuse me, King Saul, and David. David was going to marry his daughter, and he said, what do I pay for a dowry? And Saul said, he said, whoa, I'll have a hundred Philistine foreskins. Now, I don't know what Saul was going to do with that, but that's what he wanted of David. Now, obviously, Saul was hoping that in the process of collecting these foreskins, that David would be killed by a Philistine. But David was not, and he made that payment. Also, in 1 Kings chapter 9 and 15, the pharaoh of Egypt uh, conquered the city of Gezer, and he presented it to his daughter, who was married to Solomon, as a dowry. So this term, this payment, is not uncommon, even in the Bible. And also, you need to recognize that a payment has been made for the New Testament church, for the Bride of Christ. Let's take a look here at this passage in Acts chapter 20, 27 and 29. This is Paul writing to the Ephesian elders. It says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Well, that idea, there's a purchase there. Well, that could be a form of a dowry. And it's not just, you know, you notice that if you pay for something, that shows the value of it, at least at that point in time. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 1, on this idea here of a payment, in verses 18 through 20, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Now, Jesus shed his precious blood. That was the dowry payment for the church. Now, how important is the church? Well, it's reflected in the price that was paid. Jesus gave his life for it. That's how precious the church is to him. Does Jesus have a right to expect the church 
for Christians to be pure? Does he have that right? Is that something he has a right to? Does he have a right to expect for the bride to be as pure as he has been? Something you need to ask yourself. Now, a lot of preparation goes into a marriage and a wedding. That's no secret. We don't have the time to examine all the different kinds of different wedding traditions, and I'm not an expert on that anyway. But I want to sort of give you some information about how New Testament weddings, or how weddings were done in New Testament times. This comes from a book called Paul's Metaphors. It's by David J. Williams. And it's, and it's called Paul's Metaphors, Their Context and Their Character. And I thought this was really interesting. It's a two-page quote, so I want to just share it with you. It says, two men played an important role in the formation of a Jewish marriage. One known as the friend of the bridegroom took the groom's part and the other represented the bride. They had a number of duties. They acted as liaisons between the bride and the groom. To all the intents and purposes, the representatives conducted the couple's wooing and when the matter was settled, it was friends, the friends who arranged the wedding and sent out invitations. And then we go on and it says, the friend of the bride had a particular duty to which Paul refers to this passage. He must ensure that the bride came to her wedding as a Virgo intacta. Paul said of himself, via vis the Corinthians, in the role of the friend, he has wooed and won them for Christ. He had betrothed them to Christ, and now he is bound, or so he felt, to present them as a pure virgin to their prospective husbands. Now, there's some observations that we need to get from this as we talk about preparation. One is Paul viewed this work as an apostle, as a proclaimer of the gospel, that he was a friend of the bride and also the groom. So he's like one of these uh, people in a Jewish wedding. This is something that people would be familiar with in, in New Testament times. He viewed it as a work to present the congregation at Corinth as a pure version to Christ. That's one of the things he took that very seriously. Also, you know, we must do the same. You know, when we talk about going out and converting the world and we convert people to the gospel and, and they're immersed in water to wash away their sins, just like Saul was on the, you know, after when he was in Damascus at the hands of Ananias, you know, the church is a pure institution and, and we're supposed to keep it pure. Well, how do we do that? Well, we do that by following the New Testament, by following his words. When we commit sins, we repent and we pray for forgiveness. We have those sins continually washed away by the blood of Christ predicated upon our repentance and on our confession and, and prayer. And so it's our responsibility that you know, we keep the church pure. If we have people who will not remain pure, who are stubborn and rebel and will not listen to Christ and his word or the church, then the church has an obligation to have them leave. We have to keep the church pure as part of the preparation. Now notice this other explanation that I have. This is from a big multi-volume set. Uh, this is called the New Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And this is some of the things that this writer says. The allegorical use of a bridegroom bride imagery occurs first in Paul at 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, describing the apostolic office. Paul compares the community, the church, with a bride. Christ with the bridegroom and himself with the best man who has won the bride, who watches over her virginity, and who will lead her to the bridegroom at the wedding. The image is further developed in Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. Now, you know, interesting, Paul wasn't the only one that considered himself in this role. Now, as I was doing my research and study, I came across this passage, and I'm just going to read it to you. It's in John chapter 3, 27 through 29. Let's talk about John the Immerser, John the Baptist. It says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So John the Baptist viewed his work, his preparatory work for the coming Messiah in the same way that Paul talks about trying to prepare the church at Corinth, that they could be that pure, chaste virgin for Christ. And that's an important work and one that we're involved in as well. And we have to be very serious about keeping the church pure. You know, the church is a very forgiving, Christ is very forgiving, 
But we have to make sure that when we have committed sins, that we repent, we confess, and that we try to correct things. And we pray for forgiveness. That's how we keep the church pure. If people are a part of the church and they won't do those things, and they have very public sin in their life, and they won't repent of it, then we have to, you know, we have to basically withdraw fellowship from them. It's a tragic thing. And if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 8, Paul was telling the church at Corinth there was a man that was committing a public sin that was reprehensible. Even, he even said even the Corinthians, even the Gentiles don't do this kind of thing. And yet the church was just condoning it. They weren't doing anything about it. And that's wrong. Paul told them, he said, you, should have, you should have cast him out of the church if he's not willing to repent. Something that we have to keep in mind. The purity of the church, the purity of the bride is at stake. Well, let's go on. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, notice there is only one husband. That's Jesus Christ. Notice that they were betrothed rather than married. Now, back in that time, a betrothal was considered as binding as a marriage. And, and it had its own laws and customs and all that. But the betrothal period, even though it was binding as a marriage, uh, was still considered a preparatory kind of period. Now, think about this for a moment. You have this betrothal period, that's sort of preparatory. And Paul's saying here in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, that I have betrothed you to one husband. Well, when does the marriage take place? When does the marriage take place? Interesting idea, isn't it? Well, notice what it says in Revelation chapter 19, 6 through 8. I'll just read this to you. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You know, it's interesting in the Old Testament, the kingdoms of Israel and the kingdoms of Judah did not remain faithful to God. They broke the covenant. Did God just accept that? Did he just tolerate that? There's an interesting passage in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 32. It has this statement. God's talking about Judah. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. You can't forget about God. God expects attention. He, he demands it. He deserves it. We can't be neglectful of it. We can't be neglectful of our uh, worship of him, of our service to him, of our devotion to him. Judah didn't do that. They, they had periods where they were a little better than others, but as a whole, in the course of time, they drifted away. And there was a serious payment made. Israel was wiped out by the Assyrians. They were scattered. Uh, as a, you know, They were taken different places and all that, but their kingdom was destroyed. Judah would go into Babylonian captivity. That would be sometime later. There was great punishment for that maid. And even through all that, God provided. He still provided. But there was still punishment. There, God is serious about these things. He's serious about purity and about devotion. Well, let's talk about the idea of provision. Christ provides for his church. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and 22 through 23. We'll have to break this up on two separate slides. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, let, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out to you before we go on to the next part of the passage. Husbands provide the leadership for the household. 
That's something that's spelled out here. Well, Christ provides a leadership for the church. He's the head. He's in charge of that. That's his responsibility. We have no right uh, to usurp in that. The wife is to submit to her husband's leadership. The Christ, and the church is supposed to submit to Christ's leadership. We're supposed to follow his word. Husbands are to love their wives, even sacrificially, just as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself for her. And that's just something we need to keep in mind. We're the ones that are lost. We're the ones that committed sin. We're the ones that did things against the holy God. Christ is the one here through his church that's trying to save us. Sadly, some people are very bitter about the church, and that's sad. Husbands are to provide for their wives, to cherish and nourish them, just as Christ cherishes and nourishes the church through his word and his cleansing blood. The wife was to be washed and cleansed, maybe a reference to what is called a bridal bath. It's sort of a rite of purification that some people think. Uh, but it could be that he's talking about baptism here. It's Ephesians 5.26, the washing of water here refers to baptism. And that's something that's important to note. You cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now you have people today, they'll tell you, well, water has nothing to do with being saved. Nothing. And, it, and it's an attack on what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. He that believeth not will be condemned. And they will ridicule people who hold to the New Testament and say water has nothing to do with it at all. But notice here, washing of water by the word. Water is there. Make sure you don't miss that point. Well, let's go on. Let's pick up with our reading in verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband's. Well, a couple things to notice about this. You know, there is a difference between the one church in various locations and denominationalism. I mean, you're talking about one bride and one groom. You're not talking about a multiplicity of brides. You're talking about a single bride. That's something to note. Also, some people say, well, there's nothing in a name. You know, I mentioned, occasionally I'll mention names that uh, people have on their signs to designate their you know, religious group. And I'll point out, well, you know, that name isn't even in the Bible. And some people say, oh, names don't matter. Names don't matter. Really? Well, what if, you know, what if you're marrying, you know, this precious woman that you wanted to share the rest of your life with? And she said, you know what, I'm not going to take your name. I'm just not going to take your name. Maybe I'm going to have a hyphenated name. Okay, well, you know, maybe she's a Smith and she's marrying you. And maybe you're a Rogers and she wants to be a Smith dash Rogers. Well, you know, there was a time when that was sort of looked at as sort of taboo in our society, but it's pretty common now. But let me ask you this. What if she dated someone besides you? And what if she decided to take that name? Maybe she dated some guy named uh, Williams. And she said, well, I'm going you know, to marry and everything, and I'm going to change my name, but I'm not going to wear your name, and I'm not going to wear my name. I'm going to wear Williams. That's who I'm going to be. Will that go over well? See, there's something in a name. I mean, this whole idea there's nothing in a name, I don't understand how people, you know, in any other kind of circumstances, we recognize names are important. We call those trademarks in business. Remember Coca-Cola? You know, Coca-Cola spent a lot of money, a lot of research to preserve their name. If you, in some places, they used to go around and remind restaurants if they would say, would you like a Coke? And this is prevalent in the South a lot of times. People use the word Coke uh, like they use, you know, it could be talking about any kind of Coke, any kind of soda, any kind of soda pop, whether it's orange, 7-Up, Sprite. They refer to all of them as Coke. And the Coca-Cola company had to go around and remind some of these organizations, if you say, would you like a Coke? You better be serving Coca-Cola. 
and that's something that they really used to press quite a bit from, from my historical research I did in marketing. See, there, a name is important. It's important, and it's certainly important when it comes to the church. Jesus provides for his bride, the church. He provides his word. He continually cleanses it with his blood, and it's very important that we recognize that. Well, let's just sort of summarize some of our points here as we get ready to wrap up. The word nymphe define. The term means a bride. Jesus is the husband, and the bride is his church. The church is his wife. There is only one groom. There is only one bride. Now, we should be able to understand the implications of that. We should be, have no difficulty understanding the fact that, you know, when we get married, we expect purity. You know, we, we expect to have, you know, a wife that's dedicated to us, that will pay attention to us. And we hope to provide for her. We, we understand that in our day and age, at least we're supposed to. A lot of people are confused about marriage today, but we're not talking about that. But we understand the importance of a husband and a wife, a groom and a bride. We also understand that a lot of preparation goes into a marriage. I mean, the amount of I saw a young lady that was getting married, and she had a book the size, it almost looked like an encyclopedia. And it was a wedding planner book. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of preparation. Well, a lot of preparation went into the church. A lot of preparation went into it. The preparation that started before the foundation of the world, the Bible tells us. God has made great provisions for us, great preparations for the church. He has paid the price, Jesus did, and we are to do our part to be pure and undefiled. In James 1.27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The idea of visit isn't just you stop by and see them. It's you take care of them. It's serious. And to keep yourself unspotted from the world, that's serious too. That's pure and undefiled religion. We need to make sure that we're practicing that. Also, Jesus has made the provisions by which we can be cleansed of sins initially and continually by obedience to his word. And Jesus nourishes and provides for his bride. We are to keep ourselves holy and submissive to his will. The church is to submit to the will of Christ. That's the arrangement that's there. Sadly, some churches, you, you sort of wonder. You know, they may say that they love the Lord. They may say they respect him, but a lot of times it's really whatever they want. They'll do whatever they want. And they say, well, you know, I have this talent. I have this gift. I have this water. You know, and I'm going to do that. And, I'm gonna, and God will accept it. It's something that we need to be aware of. Jesus dearly loves the church. He cherishes her. He cares for her. He's done all these things for her. For her. What do we do in return? How do we reciprocate that? How do we show our love towards him? How do we really do that? You know, just talk a little bit about just an example of it. Say, just, just going to church, just going to, you know, this expression, going to church, going to worship. You know, a lot of times people say, well, I, I really don't feel like that. I just don't feel like doing that. I don't get anything out of that. I just, you know, that's just not important to me. Now, if you have a husband or wife, and they love one another, and they're devoted to one another. Is that the kind of things that you would see from that kind of relationship? Do we really love Christ? Do we really love his church? How do we demonstrate that? You know, if we never go to worship, can we say that we really love the Lord? Can we say that? I mean, we could say whatever we want to say, but is it true? Well, are you a part of the bride of Christ? How do you become part of the bride? Well, by becoming part of the body. That's how you do that. Well, how are you added to the body? Well, by putting it on Christ. Well, how do you do that? Well, Paul said in Galatians 3.27, For as many as you as were baptized into Christ 
have put on Christ. Remember, there is water in that plan. You need to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins if you want to be a part of the Bride of Christ. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, it has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then, once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.